Hello and welcome to our special coronavirus show. This is where we take your questions on COVID-19. Over the next half hour, we're joined by medical experts from around the country who will be answering your questions and ours on COVID-19 as uh, India is now on day 15 of its nationwide lockdown and questions abound on what next for the country. Is there going to be a staggered exit policy? Is there going to be some easing of restrictions? What will all of those mean in the longer term battle against the disease? We're being joined right now by Dr. S. Uh, Balaji. He's a cardiologist and a consultant uh, with Ramakrishna Hospital in Coimbatore. Uh, we're also being joined by Dr. Dhiman uh, Kahali, who is a cardiologist with the BM Birla Heart Research Center in Kolkata. Um, the first caller, I believe, is on the phone line with us right now. And uh, we have with us uh, uh, Sanat Goswami from Kolkata, in fact. Uh, go ahead, Sanat. Yes, uh, good morning, Ankita. Good morning. My, my, I have got two questions. The first question is... Um, Shonath, if, if I may uh, actually request you to uh, keep it to just one question, we do need to accommodate as many <coughs> callers as we can. Yeah, okay, my, uh, okay, I will ask the one question only. Uh, please tell me what precautions should be taken in case of utilization of vegetables, daily needs vegetables. What All yeah. right. Um, it's, it's a question we get very often. We should probably have a graphic describing just that uh, so that this question is not repeated time and time again. But if either of the doctors would like to uh, answer that. Hello, good morning. Yes, this good is morning. regarding uh, vegetables. Obviously, we have to purchase vegetables for our day-to-day -day needs. And when we go out, there's a small risk that somebody might have infected the vegetables. But again, the important thing is to come wash the vegetables, and then very important to again wash your hands with soap and water for 20 seconds once that is done. That will take care of most of the chance of infection happening. All right. Uh, I hope that was a sufficient answer to that question. Uh, as we said, we're going to have uh, a, a graphic uh, with responses to those frequently answered uh, questions that we get on the show. Um, one question that I would like to ask at this point, there's been a lot of talk in recent days, uh, Dr. Kahli, if you would like to answer this, that countries that um, did not have a BCG vaccination policy has actually seen 10 times greater yeah. incidence of uh, mortality from COVID-19 compared to countries that do. Um, now, this is that the vaccine for tuberculosis that is administered at birth in countries that have historically suffered from this disease. India is one of them. Um, can the BCG vaccine actually have an effect uh, in terms of how people are responding once they get COVID-19? Uh, you see, it's a very important question and as uh, from yesterday evening or rather for the last two to three weeks we have been notice, noticing and yesterday Ashish was there in, in your channel and uh, as there was some discussion regarding the BCG vaccination because it has been found in his paper because he's a euro -onco surgeon, yes. and uh, they give in bladder cancer cases BCG vaccination as a prophylactic measure. So, uh, it has been found that uh, who has taken the BCG vaccination or in countries where it is done universally as it is done in India, one of our countries. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the incidence is only 35 out of 1 million people, 35 to 38, as opposed to 358 in countries like US and other advanced countries where BCG is not being given as a routine practice. Yeah. And also the mortality is 4.4 in countries per million in countries where it is done, uh, you know, mortality is so low where BCG vaccination is given. But in countries where it is not practiced, it is as high as 40. So it is 10 times higher, both mortality or fatality and also the incidence. So it's a blessing in disguise for right. us, but right. it's just a postulation let us find how it behaves and it has been told regarding influenza vaccine also hmm. that who has been given the influenza vaccine though right. it doesn't give a full protection yeah. but uh, to a certain extent the persons are protected but would you recommend that people get an influenza vaccine now at, at this point or you know would uh, it... no at this point i won't advise because uh, you know it takes some times and there is no evidence that uh, taking the because we practice evidence-based medicine 
Right. And uh, there is no evidence that giving, uh, you know, influenza vaccine mm -hmm. can totally uh, prevent the occurrence of this right. COVID-19 virus infection. Rather, we should adhere to the norms which you have been seeing in your different channels. And I think those are much more important. That's yes. the non-medical okay. practices we should adhere to. Right. Raman is calling us from Chennai this morning. Uh, Raman, go ahead. Yes. Uh, uh, good morning to you all. Morning. Go ahead with your question, Raman. Yes. Shall I, shall I ask yes. the question? Yes, please. Please. Shall I ask the question? Yes, please ask your question, Raman. We're waiting. Good morning to you all. Good morning. Uh, does this uh, virus in infected cases? Yes. Yeah. Uh, does this virus in all the infected cases end up in res respiratory problems or end up in the respiratory problems okay. or, or it fades off at in some stages? Okay. Okay. Um, Dr. Balaji, if you'd like to answer that question, uh, will every case of COVID-19 end up with uh, respiratory, respiratory issues or respiratory distress? See, the uh, two common symptoms which happen with this virus are fever, cough, and then breathlessness. As you know, the incubation period for this virus is about 2 to 14 days, and commonly it happens, starts around 4 to 5 days. And majority of patients will develop fever and a cough. Mm -hmm. However, in 80% of the patients, the disease is very mild and there may be only mild fever or cough. There's another 15% of patients in whom the disease can be severe, causing mild breathlessness and so on. And in another 5% of patients, the breathlessness might be very much when pneumonia happens. And these are the patients who will need ventilation and ICU care. So not all patients will develop uh, breathlessness. Uh, 15 to 20% of patients can develop mild breathlessness. And among these 5% of patients may need ventilation. So not everybody will need uh, ventilation. 80% of patients are going to get away with a mild disease. Right. All right. One more caller. Nayan is calling us from Noida this morning. Uh, Nayan, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, good morning. Uh, my question is now uh, WHO has advised for using mask. So how are eyes we can protect and how contamination can happen through eyes? All right. Uh, See, eyes are a yes. common source of uh, getting infected. So we should not uh, rub our eyes as such. And we should try not only eyes but also over the face because per hour average 23 to 25 times we touch our faces or even eyes or nostrils. So we should try to avoid that habit. And even if it is absolutely essential, we should put a sanitizer and then uh, rubbing the sanitizer you can put. But uh, we request you not to put your uh, hand or fingers over the eyes as far as possible. All right. Uh uh, do we have Dr. Rishi Shukla also with us? Uh, uh, we'll try and get him uh, up uh, on the phone line with us, uh, on, on, on a connection with us. Uh, but I'd also like to ask at this point, um, a lot of people have been talking about underlying conditions and how those could complicate cases. Um, Dr. Kali, if you would want to respond to that, I mean, we, we, have, we were hoping to have an endocrinologist on the show also. Diabetes is something that... Uh, has, is, is, is a very common condition for so many people here in this country. How much of a complicating factor is diabetes, for instance? Should I answer? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Okay. So, you know, it has been found from the global experience that, first of all, we knew from the Wuhan experience from China that the patients who died or who didn't do well they were majority from, uh, you know, diabetic or hypertensive or having some chronic obstructive lung disease or some cardiovascular disease or history of cerebral stroke. So these are the people and there has been some publication in peer-reviewed journals as well mm -hmm. that uh, patients who have other comorbid conditions mm -hmm. and especially the elderly patient, patients, mm -hmm. elderly persons who get the infection, they do not do well. 
as we have the experience from France and Italy, because France is told to be the best country so far healthcare is uh, delivered, and Italy is second. But we have seen that the number of deaths is very high over there because the number of elderly population is much more. Right. And the average uh, age of death in Italy is 80 years. And we have seen even patients aged more than 101 years have come back from the corona hospital in mm -hmm. a very good way. Hmm. So we should be very careful, especially yeah. the elderly and the yeah. persons who have hypertension, uh, diabetes, chronic obstructive lung disease, hmm. or associated heart condition. We should be very, very careful. And we should do the social distancing very well. And we should put face mask. We should wash our hands. And we should be very careful. And uh, we should ask also the younger individuals of the house or the children not to go to the elderly population right. who are more than 60 years yeah. of age as a preventive measure. Thank you. That I think is uh, something that is being stressed continuously. The elderly have to be isolated further because they are at uh, greatest risk. Uh, um, Archana is joining us from Mumbai this morning. Archana, go ahead. Uh, good morning, doctors. Uh, will you please tell me, uh, is hydroxychloroquine is useful? Okay. Uh, so, Dr. Balaji, do you want to talk yes. about that? And you know, if I could just add, who is it most useful for? Because right now, uh, the need seems to be for health workers to use, uh, use it as a, a prophylactic, if anything. So, you know, w w what is the universal recommendation See, hydro here? Hydro hydroxychloroquine is a drug, which it is not a new drug. It has been used for a long time in people with rheumatoid arthritis and other inflammatory conditions. And chloroquine has also been used for a long time for treatment of malaria. This hydroxychloroquine has shown to be, have some action in vitro against the coronavirus by various mechanisms. It works against the coronavirus. But however, it also has side effects, especially in cardiac patients who, have other, who are on other drugs which might prolong the QT interval. And in other patients, it can have some eye effect on the eyes also. So it's very important that hydroxychloroquine should only be taken under the supervision of a medical person. The current ICMR recommendations are hydroxychloroquine prophylaxis can be given for doctors and other healthcare workers who are yes. directly dealing with COVID patients or to first degree relatives or someone who is COVID positive. These are the only uh, two situations where ICMR recommends HCQ or hydroxychloroquine prophylaxis. However, in people who have admitted to ICU who have uh, breathlessness, these people may also benefit from hydroxychloroquine. And in this group, it can certainly be given under medical supervision. Okay. But however, it's not for the general public to go and buy in the shop and take on their own without yeah. supervision. It can be dangerous. I think that's something we need to keep uh, stressing don't uh, go out, don't buy, sort of certainly don't hoard uh, hydroxychloroquine either and don't take it without uh, medical supervision. Nahar Singh is with us from Hyderabad. Nahar Singh, go ahead. Uh, my question to both the panelists is, the number of people who are suffering from symptoms, how many are being tested per thousand in India? Because I believe it is going to peak in July. All right, uh, Dr. Balaji, uh, would you like to answer first? Uh, are we testing enough, I think, is the question. Also, um, have we just not seen the peak rate of cases yet? And is that only going to happen much later? What is this going to mean in terms of restrictions going ahead? See, our country certainly has a huge population, and it's not going to be possible to test everybody for this uh, virus in our country, even the asymptomatic patient cannot be tested just like that, simply because that many kits are not available. So currently, the testing has to be reserved for people who have symptoms, healthcare workers, and people who are in direct contact to try and isolate these patients from the rest of the population. Random whole population screening is not going to be feasible. Hopefully, the lockdown measures might help in preventing uh, upsurge in cases right. and other things like BCG and so on might also help so that we may see an increase in cases, but hopefully uh, we wish that it's not as high as, as, as it's in some projections. Dr. Kali, anything you'd like to add to that? 
Uh, yeah, I think uh, testing, you know, is a very integral part of the treatment. And so testing is to be done. I think we have to increase it. And fortunately, central government and the local governments have been very proactive in increasing the number of the tests of the affected person. So we have to go, we have to increase the number of testing. Not only they tell about five T's, that's testing, uh, treating, tracing, mm -hmm. and then uh, tracking of the, these patients. And uh, that's very important to follow all this. And the uh, number which looks to be a little down in our country, that's a very good thing, maybe because of different reasons, because there are some postulations from Massachusetts Institute, there has right. been a paper which is a peer-reviewed one that above the temperature of 32 degrees Celsius, the virus doesn't survive. I don't know whether it is true or not. Hmm. Or the attachment of the virus to the cells in Indians is a very weak one. Okay. And there is a, some genetic mutation in this uh, with us, the Indians. I don't know whether that theory is correct or not. Okay. But uh, we are very happy that the numbers are not going up. Okay. But the numbers are not going up because of another reason that the testing and tracing is not sufficient. Hmm. So I think we have to increase the numbers of testing right. and both the things RT-PCR from nasopharyngeal swabs hmm. and also from blood tests, the rapid yes. test which has come, yes. I think that will uh, tell us uh, and that will catch some more patients. Well, and so that we've already we had several states measures. now yeah. saying that they're going right. to ramp up the rapid antibody testing, as it's called, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and, and then in positive cases, yeah. of course, uh, go for further testing. And we're likely to see that in the days ahead. Um, we will take a very quick break at this point, uh, but be back with all our viewers' questions in just a moment. Stay with us. Welcome back. Let's go straight to our latest caller. AC Singh is on the line with us uh, from Delhi. AC Singh, go ahead. Uh, good morning, ma'am. My question to the doctor is, is it safe to take uh, ice cream uh, during this period? So ice cream or, or any kind of cold food, is it safe? Dr. Balaji? See, we are not against taking cold food, but suppose if you take uh, uh, ice cream or cold food and get a cough or cold, it would be difficult to differentiate it from COVID at this point of time. So there's no harm in taking cold food, but however, be careful so that you don't get an infection from other sources, because even a normal infection, viral infection could be confused with COVID at this point of time, and it would be difficult to get a, a treatment uh, from many of the hospitals, as a lot of them are uh, not catering at this point of time. So right. it's very important to be careful to not to pick up another infection from another source. So yeah. be careful about what you eat and try to avoid outside food as much as possible at this point of time. All right, let's get another caller in. Uh, Mukesh calling us from Mumbai. Mukesh, what's your question? Uh, yeah, my question is like uh, fever and cough is uh, like mandatory symptoms for COVID or if somebody is facing little difficulty in breathing can also have, uh, you know, COVID. Dr. Kahali, um, can I, can you repeat yeah. the question? He's me? saying he's asking whether fever and cough uh, are mandatory symptoms. He's saying, are you always going to have those uh, symptoms when you have COVID nineteen? Yeah, as you have been showing that in eighty percent of the patient, hmm. uh, the disease is asymptomatic, so yes. we don't have to worry much about it. Hmm. But we should not neglect it also. But in twenty percent of the cases, there are symptoms of the disease, and it starts usually with cough. And then there is fever in 90% of the patient, there is fever and uh, there may be breathlessness in some 70 to 80% of the patients. And then it involves the lung and when it involves the lung, sometimes there is a lot of damage to the lungs. It's not just like the ARDS, the actual pathology which they have been fi finding in US and Europe, yes. that they block the pulmonary arterioles, means the small arterioles, small arteries in the lung tissue and there is some infarction thereof and that causes the damage and it is something different from the adult respiratory distress syndrome but mm -hmm. okay there may be some features of ARDS later on and there may be intermingling and intermixing of both mm -hmm. and in 20% of the patients they affect the heart 
and that's a so, problem. So let me for understand, Dr. Kahalit, and and to just make this simpler for our average viewer, because yeah, I yeah. think many of them will not understand the technical medical yeah. terms. Would you say yeah. that it could affect, in fact, uh, the lungs even without any uh, apparent symptoms uh, yeah, that are visible? That is the that is the danger of the uh, virus, as Antonio Fauci who is a leading epidemiologist and infectious disease specialist in EVS and the heading the team there, he tells that I don't know anything about the virus mm. even after 50 years of exposure in this field. Mm. Because sometimes the patient is totally asymptomatic, right. suddenly he gets high fever, breathless, and suddenly has to put to the ventilator. So right. this disease is dreaded, this disease is lethal, and therefore we are requesting everybody for social distancing mm -hmm. and for non-medical uh, you know, measures to take place yeah. because the treatment is also not very, uh, you know, florid, I should tell, regarding hydroxychloroquine, uh, he yeah. has commented that it is of anecdotal uh, value. So, so self-isolation, social distancing, all of these are uh, as effective, and, yeah. if not more, yeah. than, than medical ways in yeah. which to protect yourselves. All right, Jyoti calling us from California this morning, I'm told. Uh, Jyoti, go ahead. Uh, hi, good morning. Uh, hi, doctors. Uh, so I have a question, like uh, we are protecting ourselves uh, with a mask and we are not, we are avoiding, you know, touching uh, our eyes and etc. with hands and etc. But what if the droplets directly fall into our eyes? So how do we protect our eyes? All right, Dr. Balaji. See, the, uh, as you know, the droplets can spread when somebody coughs or sneezes to about six feet. So by using a mask, we can certainly uh, protect our mouth and nose. And these droplets can get in through the mucous membrane in our eyes also. So it's very important, again, if something happens, then to wash your eyes again with water and try to, uh, that's why medical personnel are advised to wear goggles and spectacles so that, and a face uh, shield so that they can protect the droplets from entering into their eyes. But for the common man, again, it's better to be six feet away from somebody so that we can try to minimize the contamination to our eyes. All right. Uh, one question coming in from Nasik this morning. Prakash wants to know, uh, he's in fact just got married. He's asking whether he should be thinking about uh, having children at this point or should he sort of postpone the decision? Uh, you know, Dr. Uh, Balaji, if you'd have like been, to... We uh, okay. requesting uh, young couples not to have children at this point and to for, wait for another four to six months because mm -hmm. there is possibility for both the mother and the newborn to get infected though that's not always happened but hmm. that can happen and so we are requesting not to become pregnant at this particular point if possible and to wait for another four to six months all right uh, that's uh, important advice uh, i'd like to thank both of you for joining us this morning it's all we have time for thank and you, thank you all for calling in with your questions remember we'll be here at 8 30 every morning to take uh, your latest questions on covid 19 thanks for watching